So we have a phenomenal and very experienced panel. Um, I want to start, my first question for both of you is how do you define political power and how have other minority groups, whether faith or ethnic communities, maximized their political power? What can Muslims learn? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Let me start by saying that what is not political power? What is not political power is to throw money at candidates at election time in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and get uh, politi politicians to uh, basically play, uh, pay lip service to you or your community or your faith. Um, and then election is over, they don't even take your phone call. Yep. That's what's not political power. What is political power? It is to be able to affect change on your local, state, federal level in a direction that for us as Muslims, a direction that, that enhances fairness, justice, and all the positive things that our religion teaches us to want for ourselves and everybody around us, but in particular, on the flip side, on the reactive side, to be able to affect change every time and any time a political uh, appointee or elected person is trying to harm our community, to be able to effectively get them to change course and realize that there is a heavy political price to pay if they are going to go that course. And so political power to me is, is a lot of hard work where it matters to be able to have the two things that matter in politics, the voters and being able to affect, bring people out to vote and not only Muslims, but as the research showed, a coalition of people that will align with you on, on some, maybe most, maybe all of, of your, of, of your uh, priorities, uh, and then be able to channel your uh, money uh, as a community uh, to, make, to make the politicians pay attention to what you want and what matters to you, what's your priorities. That's why you let Dr. Zarur go first because he'll give you the right answer. Um, my answer is political power means when the Muslim American community is on the agenda and not on the menu. And if you haven't noticed, my Muslim family, you are on the menu. When they think about who are the first groups to be targeted, you are probably the top three groups in America that gets targeted by this government. It has been targeted by this government under previous administrations, Democrat and Republican. Alhamdulillah, we're open season. It doesn't matter what political party. We've experienced that type of power. Also, I think it is easier to talk about what is not power, because I think Dr. Zahrud already told you power is when you're able to have the influence to affect change and alleviate harm on our communities. I'm just gonna say this because I just say whatever I feel like it, and if you like it, you like it, you don't like it, that's just how life works. There's a group here at Mass, at the convention, just to be clear, that's going around telling people it's haram to vote. They're in the bazaar. And I just want to make that clear. I just want you all to know that there are fatwas out there, just in case those people get to you, that we live in America, and it is your responsibility as a Muslim to participate in the society in which you live, because that is part of Sharia. And that we cannot sit back in this country and watch our communities be targeted, harmed, watch our neighbors be harmed and targeted, and sit back and say, we're not gonna participate and we're gonna allow this harm and healing, uh, harm and, and, and suffering happen to our communities. I do not believe that Allah approves of any Muslim that sits back and allows harm and suffering to happen to Allah's creation and says, it's haram for us to participate in figuring out how to alleviate that. So if you see these people, I hope that you are brave enough to stand up and say this is absolutely unacceptable and it is actually an incorrect position to take that it is haram to vote. It is not haram to vote. It is in fact your Muslim obligation to participate in the democratic process of these United States of America. And if you think it's haram, then you might want to go to a country where maybe they don't have elections or where there isn't a democracy or maybe you want to go living in a Muslim country. But if you live, if you live here and you are an American here, 
you are obligated to vote. When we heard about the Muslim ban, and I will say this to Muslims in this room, because I'm so fired up and every day I wake up like this. I'm just outraged every day. Every time I hear a story of a Yemeni father who cries over not being able to be reunited with his children or a Somali family or a Libyan family or a Syrian family, you know what? That is on us as a community because we let Trump win in Michigan. Why did Trump win Michigan, sisters and brothers? Tell me, explain to me how that happened. Wisconsin, how did that happen? Pennsylvania, Virginia, how did we let this fascist go into office and what happened the first week, guess what? The Muslims were on the menu. You were the first executive order from this administration. We went to the Supreme Court and sued on behalf of our community. You know what happened to the Muslims in the Supreme Court? You lost in the Supreme Court because you let Trump become president and then Trump appointed the Supreme Court justice and now we have a conservative majority anti-Muslim Supreme Court and we lost in the Supreme Court. And you know what the Supreme Court law says now? Any president, man or woman, has the absolute right to add countries, take away countries, put countries on the list based on their discretion. Don't blame anybody else. Gotta own it. And that's what it looks like when you don't have power or believe you don't have power or know that you have power and not use it. So I'm telling you and I'm warning all of us, we got to get it together for 2020. This is not a joke. This is not a lecture. This is about us standing together, organizing ourselves and using the power that we have as a community that for some reason we have not been able to implement. Building on that, what tools does the American Muslim community have to increase political power? What does it need? Where are the gaps and where are the tools? So we're trying to make this easy. Because the Muslims have a problem. We are very lazy people. We want everything. We want, we little, you literally want me to come to your house with a pen and paper and register you to vote. Like it's that, I've done this before, by the way. In New York City, we knock on doors in the Muslim community and I literally register you on your doorstep. That's what we've had to do. We have, we built the website. It's called mymuslimvote.org. It doesn't get more simple than that. Very easy, mymuslimvote.org. You go to the website. You are able to check your voter registration because here's the other problem. You move, you lived in Michigan, now you live in Chicago, you lived in New York, now you live in Florida, then you tell me, Sister Linda, wallah, I was registered. Wallahi, when I was in New York, I registered. I said, where, you li where do you live now? Oh, I live in Florida. Did you ever re-register now that you live in Florida? Oh, I didn't know that I had to do that. Yes, anytime you move, you have to register to vote. Lots of people in 2016 went to the polls to vote, and they told me, Sister Linda, they didn't let me vote. Because you got purged, because I asked you when the last time you voted was. You said, oh, Sister Linda, I don't remember, 20 years ago was the last time I voted. You have to check your registration. You gotta make sure that you are registered in the party that you want to be registered in. So go to mymuslimvote.org, check your voter registration. And then I need you to look around. I don't need you to be organizers. I'm not asking you to knock on people's door. I'm not even asking you to go to the masjid and do voter registration. I, I need you to look over. Yamma, are you registered to vote? Yaba, are you registered to vote? Is your brother registered to vote? Is your auntie, khalti, auntie, uncle, are, are they registered to vote? Don't worry about all of us. Worry about the people closest to you. Because if you can't even influence those in your own family, then I don't need you out here trying to influence strangers. Let's all of us commit today here to registering our own people to vote in our families. My Muslim vote has taught, I, I wrote you talking points. We even wrote talking points for your imam. Print them out. I had them reviewed, so I didn't write them. Give them to your imam and say, yeah, imam, on Friday, here's a khutbah that's relevant to our community in this time. All of the dalils, all of the encouragement, motivational talking points about why we should be engaging in the democratic process are on that website. How to do voter registration, how to organize voter engagement, how to organize a phone banking. We even have opportunities for you to call Muslim voters in other states. So if you go to mymuslimvote.org and you sign up there, there's a place also to sign up. We will send you when the deadline for you to register to vote. So the other thing is there's, there's voter registration deadlines. So for example, who lives in Illinois? 
primary election is March 17th. That's, that's right around the corner. There's a deadline for some people. I think Chicago, you're good. You have same day voter registration. Who is from Michigan here? March 10th. That's your primary. So everything's around the corner. People are thinking about November, you have elections coming up. So anyway, we have all the resources that you need. There's many organizations. There's a group called MGAGE that's also doing this work. Empower Change is doing this work. CARE will be doing voter registration, voter engagement. You already see this. I know in places like Illinois, at the, many of the masajid, I know Dr. Zaruz masjid, and many masjid, they do voter registration. What do the people do after Salai? Some brother comes up to you or sister says register to vote and you're running out of the masjid. You, these people are spending their time investing in our community to build power and you ignore them. Instead of encouraging the volunteers, encouraging the young people, they, the kids were coming up to me at the table at my booth telling me, Sister Linda, well, I tried to do voter registration in my masjid and everybody ignores me. Nobody comes to the table. At least the least that you can do is go and say thank you for your service. Thank you for what you're doing. Encourage our young people to be involved in the process. So there is not a shortage of tools. We got vote dial. We have this uh, a system now called Spoke, where we allow you to do peer-to-peer -peer texting, right? We give you lists and you text people, reminding them when to vote. We, we do everything for you. All we need you to do is step up and say, Sister Linda, I got two hours a month that I can give to you. Everybody got two hours, even the moms in the room. Let me talk to moms because I'm a mom. Nothing extraordinary about me, nothing extraordinary about Sister Dahlia. I got kids too, I gotta do laundry too, I have a family to take care of too. Please don't tell me that you have no time. That you don't have an hour a week to go at the masjid and support or do some project or organize in the Muslim community. Organize your friends, organize your sisters at your house, make sure that they're all registered to vote. We all have something to give. Do not be a bystander in this moment. Don't tell me that you're, somehow your life is so much more overwhelming than our lives. We are giving everything that we have to our Muslim community and to ensure our rights to be Muslim in America. And I'm asking you just for a little bit more. So mymuslimvote.org, go register. Um, one of my staffers is here. She has um, cards. I think she's probably giving them out and you'll get them just in case so you won't forget. Thank you, Sister Linda. So let me take this down to the ground and translate what does that mean. I live in Bridgeview, Illinois. In my precinct, where the Mosque Foundation is, we have about 1,050 registered voters last time we voted. It goes up and down because, as she said, they purge those rosters, and if you are not careful, they take your name out when you are not watching. Now, of that 1,050 voters, about 850 are Muslim-sounding names. 850. Now, Bridgeview is a town of 16,000 people. About half of the population usually are either children under the age of 18, or residents who have not become citizens yet, or illegal uh, aliens. Um, undocumented. undocumented, thank you for, for that. I caught it, I think. Um, so basically, of, of the 16,000 residents of the village of Bridgeview, there's only about 8,000 or, or so, like 9,000, that can actually are eligible to vote, that can actually go register to vote. Of those 9,000 actually, believe it or not, only slightly more than 50% register to vote. So on the rosters, given election, there's six to 7,000 voters on the roster. Follow the math with me. We started with 16,000 people population. So you have about, let's say, 6,000 uh, people registered to vote. So, so that means on election day, that's the maximum that you may have casting a ballot, right? In reality, when there's an election for president, and that's the highest usually when there's turnout, the turnout is between 50 and 60%. So how many people do we have now? 3,500 people. Town of 16,000. 3,500 people who will actually come out in the best of cycles. Let me tell you a shocker. In, an, in a primary where there is no high office contested, you can get as little as 2,000 people voting. In a town of 16,000 people. 
Now, again, I started with how many Muslims in one precinct. In the town, all of it, we are about 25% of the population, but we are about 18% of the registered voters. So there are other Muslims in other precincts, but this is the one that I want to make focal point. So let's say we have now an election for the mayor of the town. It is an off-year election, and usually local elections in Illinois are off-year uh, elections. They come in, in the spring, and there's no big names on the ballot. Sometimes there are. So you get anywhere from 2,200 to 3,500 people maximum voting in that election, right? So let's say Joe Schmo and Jane, you know, uh, uh, elected official or, or, or candidate are running. Now, each one of them will need 50% plus one to win. So if you have a total, let's say 2,400 people voted in this election, the person needs only 1,201 and one vote only to win, to become the mayor of the town. How many people are in that single precinct in Bridgeview? 850 people. You literally need another 300 votes. Meaning, in an off election, literally, and I calculated it to the best of my ability, you need about no more than 8 to 9%. Sister uh, Dahlia talked about how 10 we, we make 10% of New York. We make similar percentages in many places. You need 8 to 9% in an off-year low turnout election to literally not swing the election, literally win the election. Now, the problem I face as someone who for the last 20 years been involved in local politics, got elected to, to local uh, offices all the way from needing 1,100 votes to my latest election, I, I won by about 3,075 votes. We go to our people, we knock on their door. We have 850. I can swear to you that we work with our local political party, and so we report at the end of the election day our numbers to the precinct captain. And in fact, in our precinct, I was the precinct captain. We have a Muslim precinct captain now. But in the past, I reported to someone else who's not Muslim, who's the precinct captain. And we go to headquarters to collect all of the votes that night. I swear to you, brothers and sisters, I swear to you, there were one year, it was, there was a judge that we were supporting in our precinct. We had, until about 6 p.m., we had 98 Muslims voting. Out of 850, we went out and it's a closed neighborhood, those of you who knows the neighborhood. We knocked on door, begged people. I told them, please don't embarrass us. Because the mayor of the town, when we walk in with 98 votes at the end of the day in a day in a precinct where we have 850 names, next time he will not even care. He will not even pay attention. You cannot go ask him for anything. And that is true in every municipality in the country. That's why registering votes is like throwing seeds in the ground. It's turning out and voting. Think about it. If we are to vote consistently at 60 to 70 percent, I swear to you, you will, you, we will be out to represent, I mean, we will uh, outperform our numbers in the country. And there are communities who do that, by the way. And they reap the benefits of that where once they get a 10 to 15% percentage of the population, if they do not elect their own, they are able to dictate who can win that seat. And no way anyone who would look down at them or, or dislike them or want to legislate something against them will make it to that seat. And they are only 15% of the vote. And it is, it is all there. No, no magic bullets, no, 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 you know, you just need to be consistent Make, realize the importance of that vote and then the turnout after that. That's why we need to register to vote. And to me, that is you know, the most powerful thing we can do. There are other things that we can do. Again, becoming a precinct captain, uh, create an effective network of donors in your community that can donate to political campaigns that you can then go knock on the, on the door of the elected officials. Uh, and, and, and other, get people elected to appointed boards. The zoning board I got appointed to decided what homes go where, whether a masjid is going to be built or not. In every town in America, I swear, sometimes I sit back and think that some of the biggest battles that consume the most energy and money from us can be averted literally by having more active people. That zoning board that voted against your local masjid, if Muslims were active and have a single, single zoning board member, that vote would go the other way. I promise you. I give you an example. I sit on the board of, of my high school. Just won the election. When I got elected, 
the first board meeting, they gave us like a, basically a welcome packet. One of them was the list of employees of the districts, teachers, counselors, principals, administrators, uh, 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 what do you call it, support staff, all of that. There were three Muslim names. We make about 15% of the population of that town and surrounding, of that district. Three Muslim names out of over 200 employees of the district. I promise you within three meetings, without me saying a single word, we were, it was May and in August we started a new year. By the time we started the new year, there were 10 Muslim names on that list. I didn't say a word to the superintendent, but now he has a board member who carries the name of many of his applicants. And he needs to now watch out for, I didn't consider those applicants, were they not qualified? And all of a sudden he realized he has a lot more qualified Muslims applying for jobs that were not being considered. It took only to have a Muslim sounding name sitting on his board, let alone the work that has happened since then. So this is, wallahi, the saving in energy and money that we will do just by being more active and being appointed to those boards or winning those low hanging fruits. It will make a sea change in our condition as Muslims saves us a lot of energy, help us focus on bigger stuff that we usually chase after and never get because we forget the small stuff. Thank you. You know, Linda mentioned this this issue of some people in the bazaar um, advocating against voting. And this was a, a much bigger issue, you know, say 20, 30 years ago. When we've done research at ISPU on why Muslims don't vote, we've actually asked people, why are you not registered to vote? And the top reasons are, I don't think it's going to make a difference. Okay, so apathy, belief that your, your, your vote doesn't matter. And the second is none of the candidates represent, you know, my values or my priorities. So my question to both of you is speaking to that person in the audience who believes these things and isn't going to vote because they don't think it makes a difference or because they don't have a perfect candidate. What do you say to them? There's a sister in our community named Varisha Khan, and she's from Redmond, Washington. She got up one day and said, I'm gonna run to be on the city council of Redmond. And the Muslims were like, okay, this little 25 year old girl thinks that she could be a city councilwoman. She actually built relationships in her community outside of the Muslim community until the Muslim community then started supporting her. And she had to go into recount. So let's be clear, she was running against a 10 term incumbent, some old white man who had the seat for many, many years before her. He was like over age 60. She's 25, 13. See, somebody knows, somebody knows her. Runs the race, people supported her, but you know how our people are. We don't always believe in one another. That's another problem that we have. We just don't believe. And I always say, how are people supposed to believe in us if we don't even believe in each other? So Sister Varisha Khan got up and ran. Election day came, the race was so close they had to do a recount. And it was so close again they did another recount. And then Sister Varisha Khan won her race and became the first Muslim woman elected official in the state of Washington by 66 votes. So don't tell me your vote doesn't matter. Recently in the past week, the, in the state of Georgia, the attempt to purge, which means to remove 200,000 voters. They just did it in Wisconsin. Bet you a lot of Muslims were on those purge voters. And then when you go to the polls to vote, they tell you your name is not there. You say you were registered too bad, too late. You're not going to be counted. So I always say to our people, both you know, Muslims and people of color and others that I organize with, if your vote didn't matter, they wouldn't be trying to take your right to vote away from you. And we also, as a Muslim community, we wake up every four years. Every four years we remember there's an election and we start, oh, well, I live in Illinois, my state is blue, my vote don't matter. I live in New York, my vote don't matter. I don't need you to even worry about the presidential. It doesn't actually matter who's in the White House if we don't have congressional representation and local representation that aligns with our values. That's just the bottom line. So you need to understand that all politics is local. All, they don't say all politics is national. All politics is lo local. Who's your member of Congress? Who's your local city council member? 
Who's your state representative in your district? A lot of these laws that get passed, unwarranted surveillance, the Patriot Act, all the aid to the unlimited aid to Israel, all these things that you all care about, whether we sanction India or not, whether how we help the people of Kashmir, this all happens in Congress. Who represents you in Congress? And are you getting up and showing up at the polls? And then the Muslims will say, Sister Linda, but I don't like who's running. I don't like them. I didn't vote for Hillary Clinton because I didn't like her. Sisters and brothers, you don't go to, you, these are not people you're supposed to like. It's not about liking. This is not a popularity contest. This is when you are given a choice and you are a logical, rational human being that says, I have this candidate, yes, this candidate has a pretty bad record, and this candidate is gonna bring more harm to the communities I'm from. So as a rational person and a rational Muslim that cares about humanity and cares about your Muslim sisters and brothers and cares about your neighbors, you say to yourself, okay, this person doesn't reflect all of my values, but I know that I'm able to stand up and organize and push this person more than I can over here. So when you had a, a for example, when you had a race between someone like Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, you had a question. Fascists supported by white neo-Nazis and Islamophobes, literally every Islamophobe that I've worked against for the past 20 years got a job in the White House. They may not still all be there, but they all were the people we were against. Frank Gaffney, Steve Miller, Kobach, these are all the people that we've been telling you about, CARES written reports about them for 20 years. And guess what happened? They all got jobs. <laughs> because the Muslims were like, eh, no, we don't like Hillary Clinton. It's not about, you're not going to dinner with her, you're not inviting her to your house. And if you truly want candidates who are going to align with your values, you gotta get up and organize. You think the perfect candidate falls from the sky and says, Allah says, oh, mashallah, what a great community. I'm gonna give you a gift. Here's a candidate that supports all your issues. This is not how it works. We gotta build the political power and influence to not only elect members of Congress from our communities, Right? Because the, they should look like us too. I was just as happy as you were when we were able to elect the first Muslim American women to Congress. And of course, before that, we had Keith Ellison and Andre Carson. That's a long time coming. It's a long time, 250 years later, we should have had Muslims in Congress a long time ago. All other communities at some point had representation. And so what I say to all of you is I want you to understand that elections are not a popularity context. Elections, for me, are not how we get free. It's not how the Muslims are going to get free. It's not how black people are going to get free. Elections are about alleviating harm. It's harm reduction. It's about us be, giving ourselves the space to organize. So when I think about another four years of Trump or another four years of somebody else, because I'm going to say this very clearly here, as you know, Muslim American Society, ISPU, Empower Change, ISNA, we don't endorse candidates. We are, we are 501c3 organizations, we do not endorse candidates. So I wanna make sure that's cleared on the record. But as an individual, I endorse candidates. You, are, you already know, I don't even have to say it. I'm glad you're all Bernie bros here in this room. I'm a Bernie. The reason why I bring that up also as an example is this. Alma Bernie's not gonna win magically, sisters and brothers. He doesn't win, this is not how this works. Alma Bernie needs you to pick up the phone and call your auntie and auntie and khalti and, and your next door neighbor and the woman that teaches your kids Quran and who your imam is and who you, everybody gotta get a phone call. And then you gotta wake up on the day that's election and get in your car and say, who in my block can I take in the car with me and take to Voting, you gotta do something. This is not magic. Allah is not, has not decreed that Ammo Bernie is gonna be the next president of the United States of America. We gotta work. And the same thing for when you like a candidate in your community who's running for judge or running for city council or running for Congress. You gotta get up and do something. This idea of engaging in the electoral process, the beginning step is registering to vote. The next step is going to the polls. But the real way to be a community that's involved in politics is you gotta go knock those doors. And let me tell you about when Muslims knock people's doors. I've been knocking doors for 20 years. When you knock a door and the person looks out the window and sees a hijabi or a person that looks Muslim, they always open the door. Because they wanna know why you're there. 
they don't actually assume that we would be knocking on their door to tell them to go vote. And so when I do door knocking, they're always shocked about when I come back with, the, with my paper or my iPad and they're like, how did these many people open the door for you? Because I was like, they wanted to know why I was outside. We are a very powerful tool in, on electoral campaigns. I have never been on an ele electoral campaign in New York City where they were like, we don't want Muslims on our campaign. They were like, we want Muslims. And how about, um, you know, the young sisters, you know, the, they mean hijabis, because the hijabis really, and I'm not saying that that means we're more religious or faithful than the per sisters that are not hijabi, but because we are visibly Muslim, we're actually key tools to getting people to open doors and having these types of conversations. So if you have a candidate running, I know there's many candidates running in Illinois, Michigan has candidates, Sister Rashida is gonna need you on those doors. Sisters and brothers, do not assume that Rashida and Ilhan are going back to Congress. Get up, if you're from Minnesota, if you're from Michigan, you gotta support these candidates. But please never say to anybody that it doesn't matter. Everything matters. And I'm gonna give you one last example. Every time I go to an event across the country, I've been to 46 states. Sister Linda, what do we do for the people of Kashmir? Well, sister, my heart breaks. Look at what they're doing in India to the Muslim, Uyghur Muslims in China. Sister Linda, look what they're doing to the Rohingyas. Sister Linda, look at in Sudan and in Somalia and look at in Yemen haram and in Palestine haram and everything's haram and everybody's heart is so broken. Aren't you ashamed as a Muslim community that we have absolutely no influence or power to do anything for our Muslim sisters and brothers? You don't think right now in Palestine and in Yemen and in, 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 a, in a camp in China, someone's thinking to themselves, where are my Muslim sisters and brothers in America? What are they doing? We are the most, we have chosen to live in the most powerful country in the world. America with a snap of her fingers can tell China economic sanctions. We can sanction nations. We can stand up and say we will not stand for the oppression of any people, but including Muslim people around the world. And for some reason, our voices have not reached the highest because we have decided to dwell in the oppression, to complain about the oppression against our communities, and never once have we been a, a solution-oriented community that says we and our people that are in concentration camps in China, they deserve for us to be organized. This is not about you. This isn't about you. you might be a doctor, you may be a college student, you may have health care, you may be good, but there are people in our communities that are not good. And you have a responsibility and obligation to those people to get up and organize. I'm not asking you to risk anything, sisters and brothers. The people of Syria got up because they were like, we are ready for free elections in Syria. The people of Yemen and got up and they said, we want to be a united nation and we want access to free elections. In Egypt, all across the Muslim world, people have gotten up and said, we are ready to stand up to the world's militaries. We are willing to stand up to dictators for a right to free election. And you live in America where you just get up out of your house and go into a booth and you don't have to worry about a sniper taking you or kidnapping you or your children or your father. And you don't even choose to do that in this country. And every day I sit and I'm ashamed. Not, I'm not ashamed on your, I'm ashamed on my own behalf. Because I ask myself every single day, am I doing enough? And sisters and brothers, if I'm asking myself if I'm doing enough, what are you asking yourself? I need you to really go home and reflect on what we're saying here today, that there are people who are counting on you. Literally. They are counting on you and for you to raise your voices, to engage in the political process. And in 2020, if you live in Wisconsin, Ohio, Michigan, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Florida, Texas, Arizona, you got no choice. You gotta get up, you gotta organize, and you gotta win because you are swing voters. We did the data, we have the Muslim surname list that Dr. Zahru talked about. We take a Muslim surname list, we run it against the voter database in every state. And we, by ourselves, if we got up as a community in those states in a general election, we will crush Donald Trump if we got up. Only if you, only if you want to do that. Only if you want to do that. And I just want to be clear here. I don't believe that crushing Donald Trump in an election is going to alleviate all the harm that we're talking about. But it is a starting point, sisters and brothers. We need an administration that we can have some influence over. We need an administration that we can work with and we can have these conversations that we can educate. And right now, you do not have that. You are the farthest away from power that we have ever been in this country. 
And that is not okay and it is not acceptable and we have to do more. So in another life, I was a math teacher. Um, and as a math teacher, if you ask me what is the absolute most heartbreaking thing that you encountered, I'll tell you, and this is to the point of my vote doesn't matter, is when I have a student who comes to me and they are doing 12%, 20% on an exam. And I work with them and they work with me and they are optimistic and they, they go up to 35, to 47, to 49, to 52 and then they get upset and say, Mr. Zarzur, I'm just dumb. I'm just not good at math. And they give up and they never realize that their, you know, their, the, the threshold for them to get out of getting an F on an exam is so near. All the progress they have done. It is not all or nothing. To me, that's the most hard, you know, breaking thing. And in terms of electoral, you know, uh, politics and our community's condition, this is the most heartbreaking. Where our community says, it's all not making a difference. And it's all to nothing. Not realizing the progress that we have made and that it is never all or nothing. I'm guided always in my political work by two principles that I learned in my religion. One of them is that as a Muslim, I have a religious fiqhi duty that if I'm given two things and one of them is harmful 90% and the other is harmful 50%, I have a religious duty. My fiqh tells me I must. It's haram for me to pick the 90% harmful thing if I have an option of 50%. And the other one is that if you cannot attain perfection on anything, you don't walk away from it. But unfortunately, we as Muslims in the last couple of centuries have become literally preconditions on this, on this all or nothing notion. This notion of all of us waiting for a Salahuddin, waiting for that one big impactful person event thing that's gonna swing our condition from horrible to great. And that will never happen. Including, by the way, this phenomena that every once in a while we get people who all of a sudden out of the blue, they want to run for, for Senate or for Congress in our community and they've never touched politics with a, with, a, with a stick. Where do you think you are going to go with that? Look at facts. When you look at the facts, for example, do you know that only 8% of senators in the United States have never held elected offices? And those 8%, by the way, they make up for it by being one of two things normally. Either they are veterans that have served the country and made themselves a name or sacrificed, like let's say Tammy Duckworth in, in Illinois, a, 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 a helicopter fighter who, who, who was shot down uh, in battle and, and had her two, two legs amputated and she comes back and, and even then she had to run for Congress and win congressional seat. Then she became a senator. Either veteran or people who are uh, heirs to large, you know, the Rockefellers, the, you know, the Myers of the world. Those are the only two exceptions normally. Two people who literally cut their teeth day in, day out, starting, as I mentioned, at the school board level, at the city council level, at the state senate level. We ought to change that mentality of my vote doesn't matter, and if I'm going to make a difference, it better happen yesterday. It is gradual process. Today we have four congressmen and women who are Muslim. We had none 10 years ago or 15 years ago. We have four today. We have increasing number of people who are representing us at the local level. And again, for those of you who say my vote doesn't matter, I want you to know a school district in Illinois, like Orland, for example, where there's now a growing, ever growing Muslim population, their budget is $123 million every year. They spent it on whatever they think is a priority. And, and Muslims of that town are absent from the priorities of 230. And we know that because just a month ago, one of the schools of the district had a huge thing over, over some, some kid you know, desecrating the Quran because he claimed he was bullied by some kids. And the school hardly did anything about it. $123 million important decisions taken, we are nowhere at the table. So even if you don't win Congress or Senate or whatever, there are, you know, Cook County, Illinois is the third largest county in the country, 
has a budget of $6 billion. If it were an economy, Cook County would be like the 49th economy of the world. We had one of our students who ran and was 1,500 votes short of sitting at the table deciding where this, those $6 billion are spent. Now, he's running for another position that is just as powerful. He will make it. If not this election, he will make it the next one. But without building that knowledge of the system, that ability to mobilize, without having those people in the system progressively getting better until we get the big wins, that's where I really believe that's the mind shift that if we have, our community would be in a totally different state. Let's give up this idea of the hero, Al-Qaid al-Mulham, the one person who's gonna save us, the savior. Let's give up also this thing, either we get rid of the Paghut in one swoop, or we live under his thumb or her thumb forever. Well, it's his thumb really, <laughs> all over the world. Uh, literally his, his thumb. Let, let's give up that and realize that it is the everyday action the everyday action that we need to do, the building from the ground up. And this is what this session is about. If you walk away with nothing else, I would say what my sister said about registering to vote, getting everybody in your circle to vote, and then going out and voting. And the second, get the low-hanging fruits. Get involved to where you get the small victories because the difference they make, the overwhelming majority of the budget that is spent on, in the United States, it's not in the hands of the federal government. It's in the hands of local governments and state governments. And the threshold is a lot, a lot uh, lower for us to get in. And the people who harbor uh, uh, ill will towards us are a lot less in numbers and a lot less powerful on local levels. And so let, let's make this a turning point for us where we realize as our religion dictate if we cannot get something 100%, we get as much of it as we can. And if two things are presented to us at any time, it is our religious obligation to take the thing that is less harmful to us until, inshallah, we no longer have to think in that di dichotomy or that kind of mode where we can choose between the better and the best. But until then, sitting on the side, we are only perpetuating what we are in now. Thank you. We only have a few minutes, so we're going to jump right into questions. Um, several people asked about voting for candidates that hold some views that are against our Islamic teachings, and we just heard a lot about that, about uh, the need for choosing between the lesser of the two evils. But I want, there were several questions just for Linda, and I'm going to let her um, address those and then we will be closing out. Thank you. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> is all I have to say. Okay, so I'm gonna go through these really quickly. There's a sister here in this room um, who, and I, I, feel with, I feel with you, because this is the story of my life too, which is probably why you asked me. Uh, someone saying that they have been appointed to their own city commission and their biggest critics are not the neo-Nazis and the right-wing Zionists and the white supremacists, it's the Muslims. That's the story of my life. And all I can say, and so there's, you know how our Muslim community, if sisters get involved in politics too much, you're never gonna get married, nobody wants a sister that talks too much and does all these things, and you know how our people are. I promise you, sister, there's somebody out there for you who's going to appreciate your bold voice, your professionalism, and you representing our community. And what I will say to you is, my, 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 my favorite quote that I saw one time um, a couple of years ago on social media that really speaks to me about critics is I say, I don't take any critique or any advice from critics without credentials. Don't take critiques from people without credentials. If they're not doing something better than you or they don't have a solution to the issue that they have, walk away. And the bottom line is there's always going to be somebody that doesn't agree with you. That's just life. And we cannot just keep getting discouraged and walking away from doing important things because somebody in our community doesn't agree with it. So keep your chin up, keep doing what you're doing, remember who you are, stay unapologetically Muslim, remember where you came from, and continue to do the work that you do. The question is, why don't we have a PAC? I want to ask that person, why don't we have a PAC? Who are, who's supposed to make the PAC? Me? Like, I'm just waiting, waiting to, your, to Dr. 
Zarzu's point that there's a lot of people who ask for things, but we need leaders and others in our community to stand up and say, we're going to get together, we're going to help you start something. Can we use your influence? Can we use your relationships? But we got to, we need more people. We don't have enough people. But what I will say is we do have American Muslims for Palestine, because the question is, why don't we have a pact to combat a group like APAC? We do have American Muslims for Palestine, and they do a great advocacy today on Capitol Hill. Last year, they had almost 600 people that showed up beautifully walking the, the members of the halls of members of Congress. They're doing it again this year. Go to American Muslims for Palestine, sign up, show up. I'm pretty sure it's going to be big this year. Um, they, did, they had meetings with members of Congress last year, and a lot of members of Congress were like, this is amazing. We need to see more of you. We always get to hear the other side, but we never get to hear your side. So this is great. And they were very welcoming of all the people that came. So let's start with uh, supporting a group that already exists, which is American Muslims for Palestine, who is here at this convention. Here's the question I get at every convention. Sister Linda, I want to support you, but you support LGBTQ rights. You're always talking about abortion. Stuff for Allah, Sister Linda, I don't know. Here's what I want the Muslim community to understand. And I want you to listen to me very carefully, because hopefully this will be the last convention that I answer this question for the 999th time. Sisters and brothers, this issue, these issues that you keep bringing up are not about the theological stances and positions and beliefs that Muslims have about those issues. That's not the point here. The point from a political perspective and the question that I put back to the Muslim community is this. Do you support the government legislating what women do with their bodies? That's what I'm asking you. If our deed is clear and we have very clear parameters on issues of abortion, for example. It's very clear. Any imam, any sheikh, any scholar will tell you exactly the parameters and guidelines about an issue like abortion, right? It's clear. No one is encouraging women to get abortion. In fact, even the movements in America, they're not encouraging women to get abortions. This is not pro-abortion movement. This is a movement that where people believe that women should be able to choose for themselves and their families. And sometimes women, who are making very hard decisions for many reasons, some of which are prescribed in our deed. If the woman, if, if there's a, a threat to her life or the child's life, there's many reasons. But that's not even the point. In France, the government of France legislated that women are not allowed to wear hijab in university or to get public sector jobs or even to wear burkini on the beach. So the question to the brothers in the room, do you support evangelical Christians who are not your friends to legislate and tell me what to do with my body. This year it'll be abortion, next year they'll say no hijabs. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm fighting for. Our dean prescribes to us and says, we are not allowed to drink alcohol. Mazboot, right? No alcohol. Do you need a law? that says Muslims are not allowed to drink alcohol for you to not drink alcohol? So what's this whole thing about abortion, not abortion? We need to make sure that we understand that this government and those who are elected in office don't represent us or our values as a community, and you cannot give them power over your daughters and wives' bodies. That's what, that's what I'm fighting for. When it comes to LGBTQ issues, here's what I believe. This is not about what Islam and the position that Islam takes about homosexuality. That is very clear in the deen. I'm not a Muslim reformer. What I believe is that we live in America and that everybody who lives in America deserves to walk down the streets of their community in safety and in dignity. And that we have to understand that when we get up and walk into a coalition, if we go to a, a protest for Palestine, guess who's at the protest? members of the LGBTQ community fighting for our rights. When a masjid is vandalized, the first people to show up are our LGBTQ neighbors to come and stand with us. I will never in America tell a community, don't come stand in solidarity with me. And in fact, if someone is harmed or hurt in your community, I'm going to stand with you because you don't deserve to be harmed in this country. Just like a Muslim doesn't deserve or a Jew doesn't deserve to be harmed or a black person or undocumented person. So this is not about theology. I'm not asking Muslims to give up their religious beliefs. I am saying to you that we live in a country of laws and there is a constitution. And we as Muslims, in order to uphold the constitution for our rights as Muslims, we need to make sure the constitution upholds everybody's rights. And when you start fighting against the rights of one community, 
then you don't have a right to fight for your rights in this country. That's what I believe. And so, and so I just want people to understand that I'm not a theologian. I'm not a scholar. I never went anywhere. You will never find me anywhere saying, Salam alaikum, I am a religious scholar and I'm here to explain to you what Islam says. I am a political activist. You want a fatwa? Sheikh Omar Suleiman will give you a fatwa. Go to Sheikh Yasser Qadi and Imam Suhaib Web. Those are your fatwa guys. I'm not a fatwa lady. I don't go and explain Islam to anybody. When people ask me religious questions, I send them to the right sources. But if you want to organize politically, I'm the person. So that what I also am opening the space for is our imams don't want to do what I do. Let me do that. And let our imams stay in their lane and do their religious scholarship and their uh, giving ilm to our communities. And I'm going to be the political activist who defends your right to be a full Muslim in America. And that means that we have to uphold everybody else's rights to be whoever they want to be in a country like this one. Quickly. This one is for parents whose kids are involved in politics, and I know you love your kids, you want to encourage them and motivate them. You're afraid they're going to get harmed, they're going to get hurt, you're worried your daughter's going to get arrested because you've seen me get arrested before. I get it. I choose to be arrested, just to be clear. Sisters and brothers, as Muslims, we only have one fear, and the fear is of Allah. And if you believe in your heart that you are doing the right thing, you're not afraid of getting arrested, you're not afraid of any harm that's going to come to you. I'm not afraid of Islamophobes. They send me death threats. They send me mail to my house. They have threatened me. They have defamed me. They have vilified me. And I still get up every morning. And I still organize. And I still am unapologetically Muslim because I fear Allah. I only look for Allah's approval. So don't worry about your kids. Let your kids be courageous. Don't scare them. Don't pull them back. Because if we don't encourage our kids to defend us and our communities, who's going to defend us? What's left? So if all of you in this room, I hope that you leave here with courage. And tawakkalu ala Allah. If Allah wants me, he's going to take me. It might be through an honorable way, or I might just walk outside this convention and get hit by a car. Allahu alam, I don't know. So at least in the meantime, I'm going to make it worthwhile. The last question is, there's a lot of issues happening in Minneapolis and Minnesota. There's a lot of issues happening everywhere. Your elected officials work for you. And this is how I want the Muslims to think. Every member of Congress, every state legislator, every city council member, every alderman, every mayor is getting paid with your taxpayer dollars. I am their employer. You are their employer. So that's how I want. I don't like, Muslims are always like, please do this for us, do this for us. And we're talking to them like, like we're asking them for favors. I don't ask anybody for any favors. You work for me. You need to stand with my community. You need to provide services to my community. You need to treat my community like you do any other community. And when you don't, I'm your employer. And come re-election time, you are fired. You know how we fire them? Register to vote, go to the polls, and vote them, and put them out into the streets. So I want you to leave here organizing from a place of power, a place of influence. Because we do have influence. We just haven't learned how to use it in the right way. And I want you to leave here as a Muslim American who is proud of who you are, that you stand in your convictions and in your beliefs. But remember that you have neighbors. And when your neighbor is hurt, you are hurt. When you are hurt, your neighbor is hurt. And that as a Muslim, your responsibility is to bring justice to the societies in which you live. And that means justice for all. Nothing in Islam says justice just for the Muslims. Never happened, never saw it, nobody's been able to prove it to me. Justice is for all people who are harmed, broken, and marginalized, and in this country, unfortunately, there are many of those people. And I just wish that more Muslims were organized and more Muslims were courageous, and I truly believe that justice in America will come at the leadership and hands of Muslim Americans. Alhamdulillah, this is how we're gonna end this session. Jazakallah khairan, wassalamu alaikum.